So let's uh, let's move on. And uh, next, I would like to give a word to our uh, second keynote speaker, to Mr. Jonas Wenden. Mr. Wenden is a chief of staff of Nordic Council of Ministers from Secretary General Office uh, in Denmark. Before starting at the Nordic Council of Ministers, Mr. Wendel was the Swedish ambassador to the North Korea, representing Nordic countries, US, uh, Australia and Canada. He has also been the minister councillor at the Embassy of Sweden in Helsinki. And to be honest, uh, the list of the different diplomatic jobs is impressive and very long, so perhaps I will uh, stop here. The title of his presentation is Cross-Border Mobility, a Regional Matter of National Importance. Please, Jonas. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's good to participate. I only wish we could have met in, in beautiful Tallinn, but uh, these are strange times. Uh, I think Yussi said he was in his office. I'm actually in my daughter's bedroom. So again, strange times. Uh, the title of my intervention is uh, Cross-Border Mobility, a Regional Matter of, of National uh, Importance. I think I will touch upon some of the issues that Yussi mentioned, but from a Nordic perspective. But before I go into the, the heart of the matter, so to speak, let me just say a few words about the uh, Nordic Council of Ministers, so that you understand the context in which we are working. Yes. So the Nordic Council of Ministers is the intergovernmental body promoting Nordic cooperation. Um, we are not a mini EU in the sense that we have no powers of our own to create policy. Um, rather, we are policy enablers in the sense that we initiate, execute and follow up on political decisions that are taken by, by our governments. We, are, we have a dual role as an arena where we organize meetings between different ministers, but also an actor in our own right by our right to actually initiate and propose uh, different uh, actions for the ministers to, to take. At the moment, we convene our ministers in 11 different settings. And we also have one special council where the Baltic ministers uh, participate. That is one concentrating on digitalization. And as you mentioned, our secretariat is in, in Copenhagen. And just to briefly point us out on, on the map. Five countries and three autonomous regions in Greenland, the Faroe Islands and, and the Åland Islands. And combined, we are a force to be reckoned with. Not least are we the 11th largest economy in, in the world. So, why do we promote cross-border mobility? Some of these things were already mentioned by Yussi, so I will not dwell upon them for, for a very long, long time. But we have come to see cross-border regions as engines of, of growth. If you take the example of, of the uh, Öresund region, uh, combining Malmö and Copenhagen, that region alone generates 25% of the total GDP of Sweden and Denmark. So cross-border regions cannot be overlooked. And as, as you mentioned, there are quite a number of reasons why we should look into these regions. I've mentioned a few here that through cross-border mobility, you will create a greater pool of talent for employers to choose from. The networks that you create will promote innovation and creativity. You will also have the possibility to create differentiation, specialization and economies of scale. And just the fact that you expose yourself to international competition will prepare yourself for bigger markets. It will give you the chance to 
to test your own skills, your own products in a different environment. So the economic benefits, apart from the social and cultural benefits of promoting cross-border mobility are evident. If we look at the Nordic experience, you can say that cooperation has been driven both from below and from above. Below in the sense that we have a common history, we have a proximity in culture and in language, a common set of values, and there has always been a sense of, of uh, togetherness. Of course, there are also many interpersonal relations. People marry across borders, uh, they have family on different sides of the borders and so on. So there has always been a push from below to work for closer integration between the Nordic countries. But that push from below has been combined with a support from above in the sense that political decisions have been taken. I'm talking here about uh, decisions such as um, agreements to avoid double taxation, um, agreements to recognize uh, or mutual recognition of, of educations and, and professions, um, that we try to streamline uh, administrative processes to reduce red tapes and of course to put an infrastructure in place in terms of bridges, roads, ferries and so on to actually facilitate physical movement. So the question is then if, if these factors, this long combined history, common uh, languages, languages and so on are not in place, what does it mean? Does it mean that if, if you don't have these prerequisites in place, if you cannot follow the Nordic way, is there not another way to, to follow? And I think the answer is clearly yes. I think the essence of any cross-border strategy is to create mutual trust and a shared long-term vision. I think we have to understand that for an individual, for a company, for, for well, yes, for an individual or company, to actually uh, move abroad, study abroad, or to work across borders, is a, carries a, it carries a risk. And in order to take that risk, there has to be a credible political commitment to convince individuals and companies that the risk is worth taking. So mutual trust and a shared long-term vision for a region and how it is to be designed in a way that promotes and protects cross-border mobility is essential. In, in the case of the Nordic region, trust has always been described as one of our uh, key assets. It's been called the Nordic gold. Of course, trust is always hard to measure. But if you look at studies that have been done by the European Social Survey, the last one is actually for 2014, and perhaps the numbers have now changed. But this is the latest study that we have access to. You can see that the Nordic countries uh, are all uh, well placed. Actually, we have the four top spots there. And this, this means quite a lot. Mutual trust is of essence. Of essence. It's an, again a key factor if you are to invest in a future across borders. Uh, as for the Baltic countries, I can see that Estonia, Lithuania also scores quite well. Latvia is not on the list here, but it means that this key factor is, is, is also, to some extent, in place in, uh, in the Baltic countries. And that gives you something to, to build upon. So trust is in place. And if I now look into the visionary aspect, the long-term commitment, our prime ministers adopted uh, last year, in August 2019, a vision for Nordic cooperation. And you can see at the heart 
is a commitment to work in order for the Nordic region to become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world by 2030. And <clears throat> the fact that the prime ministers, the top level in our political, in our political apparatus, is putting themselves behind this vision. It means something. It, it is a clear signal to those investing in a cross-border future that they will have political support for their endeavors and their plans. And that is, again, very important. The fact that this is also at the very heart of the vision is a signal that the prime ministers understand that issues related to integration are very complex. They have to be an integrated part of many areas. They cannot be seen as an add-on to something else. They have to be something that is immersed in every political, political area. So if I've now given an overview of, of what to do, let's move into the area of, of how to do it. And again, I will share our experiences, and this is not a one-size-fits-all model. But in our case, the Nordic Council of Ministers, we are following a five-steps model when we work with uh, cross-border issues and especially uh, freedom of, of movement. The first step, of course, is to identify any obstacles, any... Oh, sorry, I'm at the wrong... I should be here. So, sorry. So the, the first step is to identify uh, any barrier to, to freedom of movement. And this is done mainly through uh, our citizens. Any, citizens. any citizen can report a barrier to, to freedom of movement. We have offices in all Nordic capitals, and we have also four regional offices in, in our border regions. And of course, we also have websites where you can file complaints or report uh, a barrier to, to freedom of movement. That report is then verified by the Secretariat in Copenhagen. Sometimes uh, complaints uh, are more uh, due to a misunderstanding or the fact that markets do uh, work differently in, in different countries. So we have to verify that this is actually a, a barrier to, to um, freedom of movement. I've written trade, but it's actually freedom of movement in, in more general terms. But once we have verified that this is a true barrier or true obstacle, we register uh, that optical in a database. That database is, is open to, to anyone. At the moment, we have roughly, I think, 80 to 100 registered uh, barriers uh, in that uh, database. Again, it's a way to name and shame and, and to put peer pressure on, on those responsible for removing uh, the barrier. But we also work in a more active way through a special Freedom of Movement Council that has uh, the task of choosing a number of traits from the uh, a number of obstacles from the database and address them. Once they have addressed them, once uh, the obstacle is is solved, you have to let the world know. I think there is always an acceptance from the public that every now and then there will be obstacles to freedom of movement. As long as you can show that there is a forward momentum, that you address the problems and you try to do something with them, there is an acceptance that development will not be completely linear, that there will be ups and downs. But this long-term commitment to actually convince our citizens that yes, we listen to you, we will address the problems in a serious manner if you flag them to us, that is very important. So I mentioned the Free Freedom of Movement Council that is a key player in, uh, in our setup. 
uh, again, it is anchored at the very top. This is a, a council at the uh, disposal of the prime ministers. It was established by them at their initiative in 2014. It has a member from each Nordic country. Uh, it could, could be uh, a politician, could be a member of, of, from the business community. At the moment, we have actually four former ministers in, in that body. And again, they are not policy makers. They are policy enablers. They have no formal powers, but their role is to use their own networks to lobby against politicians based on our database. They will pick up to 12 barriers each year and try to solve them through their networking. And so far they have been quite successful. They have removed approximately 60 obstacles to trade altogether since, since late 2014. So the model is, is working. Sorry, I will skip these two because they are not... If I now try to look ahead, and this is my, my uh, last slide. Um, this was also mentioned by, by Christo in, in, in the beginning. The different strategies that different Nordic countries uh, have adopted to counter COVID-19 constitutes a, a serious challenge to, to the Nordic uh, model. And again, it's not the crisis in itself. It is the way that the crisis has been, has been dealt with. I think it has created uh, uncertainty in the border regions. People understand now that it cannot be taken for granted that the borders will remain open. And this again affects the very heart at our cooperation, the mutual trust. If we cannot trust that borders will remain open, if we cannot trust that there is a long-term shared uh, vision about a joint Nordic region, how will you then be able to invest in a Nordic future as a business, as an individual? I can now see that my time is, is running out, but perhaps I will have the chance to <clears throat> return in the panel to the way ahead and, and, and the problems ahead that I see. So I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Renden. And uh, we have here one uh, question uh, from the audience. Uh, you mentioned that Nordic uh, cooperation was supported from above and mentioned the efforts to avoid uh, double taxation of to build infrastructure. In other words, governments have facilitated cross-border mobility. But how did they promote it behind, behind merely enabling it? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> in one sense, uh, we are lucky that there has always been a popular demand. I mean, this has been a people-driven initiative. People has wanted to, to move across borders, to take jobs across borders. So in that sense, Facilitate has been the role of, of the political uh, uh, level. To actually proactively promote it, uh, I would say that has not really been needed, not yet at least. Um, I think, and this is one of the, uh, the challenges ahead, I think that for the first time, uh, the push from below can no longer be taken for granted in the Nordic countries. There is a, a, uh, the threshold, so to say, to move across borders, to take a job across borders, has been raised through the COVID-19 crisis. And that means that uh, politicians will probably have to push and take more proactive initiatives in the future to promote cross-border uh, integration. But so far that has not been done. Uh, there are no initiatives uh, in terms of lower taxes or uh, other benefits if you take a job in another country. So in that sense, it's right, yes, we have facilitated from the political level, but enabling, there, so far there has not been a need really. 
Thank you.